Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Hopkins at Home program entitled From Baltimore to Buenos Aires, New Directions in the Jewish Study Collections at Johns Hopkins. I'm Margaret Burry, the Assistant Director for Academic Liaison and Special Collections at the Johns Hopkins Sheridan Libraries, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you today to the 2022 Paula U. Hamburger Endowed Lecture. This memorial lecture was established in 2003 to honor Paula, the late Paula Hamburger's devotion to Johns Hopkins University Libraries by her son, the late John Greenspan, and her granddaughter, Katie Applefeld. We are thankful for their generosity that makes it possible for us to bring you today's program, highlighting recent additions to our Jewish Studies collections and how they are being used by Hopkins faculty and students. I'm delighted to introduce one of our speakers who is part of our academic liaison librarian team at the Sheridan Libraries. Dr. Max Salen is librarian for classics, comparative thought and literature, Jewish studies and modern languages and literature. In his current role, he oversees collection development, reference and instruction in the, in the Sheridan libraries for French, German, Greek, Hebrew, Latin, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish and Yiddish languages and literatures. Mac joined the Sheridan libraries in January, 2020 and immediately began to expand our holdings in Jewish studies. He earned his PhD in classical studies from Duke University and his Master of Science in Library Studies from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Before I turn the program over to Mac, I do have one housekeeping note. Please go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A uh, portion of the um, uh, Zoom at the bottom of your screen. My colleague, Will Quinn from Hopkins at Home will be moderating the Q&A session that will take place at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Max Salen. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Margaret. It is my pleasure to introduce my co-presenter, Dr. Samuel Spinner, who is assistant professor in the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures at Johns Hopkins University, where he holds the Zelda and Meyer Tendetnik Chair in Yiddish Language, Literature, and Culture. Dr. Spinner earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from Johns Hopkins University and his PhD from Columbia University. Following a visiting assistant professorship at UCLA, he returned to Hopkins as a postdoctoral fellow in 2014 before becoming assistant professor at the same institution. His first book, Jewish Primitivism, published last year by Stanford University Press, exemplifies his diverse research interests in Yiddish and German Jewish literature, art, and culture of the 19th and 20th centuries. His next book project, currently under development, stands to expand these interests further through the exploration of monumentality and Holocaust memory. I feel very lucky that I've had a chance to collaborate with Sam since coming to Hopkins, and I look forward to describing our work together uh, today. Thank you so much for that introduction, Mac. Uh, I'm excited to be able to show everybody some of the amazing books that, that we've gotten to the privilege of, of purchasing and, and the honor of, of being able to steward in our collections. Um, but to get us started, I think you're gonna give us a bit of an overview of your domain, uh, and then we'll talk about a few really cool books. That's correct, thank you, Sam. The history of the Jewish Studies Collection at Johns Hopkins University goes back to the university's foundation in the last quarter of the 19th century, which saw the creation of the forerunners to the departments of Near Eastern Studies history, and others which concern themselves in some ways with Judaism and what we would today term Jewish studies. It is important to note, however, that materials acquired by these and other departments on biblical Hebrew, Semitic philology, Old Testament archaeology, and other aspects of Jewish history and culture were not initially acquired specifically for a department of Jewish studies or even a program, as there was none at Hopkins until September of 2002 when the university announced the creation of the Leonard and Helen R. Stolman Jewish Studies Program with the assistance of a $5 million gift from Leonard and Helen R. Stolman, the former of whom graduated from Hopkins in 1926 and spent his life in Baltimore and the metro area as a developer and later as a philanthropist. The focus of the Stolman Jewish Studies Program at JHU is not and has never been theological, which is unusual in the context of a Jewish studies program in the United States. This is owed primarily to the fact, I think, that JHU doesn't have and never has had a department of religious studies or religion. 
in large part due to its roots as a non-denominational 19th century secular German research university, which ultimately allowed Jews to be welcomed into the Johns Hopkins community practically from day one of the university, when JHU's first president, Daniel Gilman, appointed James Joseph Sylvester, a British Jew, as professor of mathematics. One could devote an entire talk to the prominent Jewish members of Hopkins who went on to make indispensable contributions just to Jewish studies, perhaps most notably Cyrus Adler, who became the first American to receive a PhD in Semitics from an American university when he graduated from Hopkins in 1887, and then essentially went on to invent the concept of collecting Judaica while a librarian at the Smithsonian. Time, however, prevents us from doing so today. However, um, the, the point I want to emphasize is that Jewish studies at Hopkins, like its practitioners, represents an inherently interdisciplinary mixture of language, history, material culture, and religion. This interdisciplinarity is reflected in the historic strengths of the Jewish studies collection in the libraries at Hopkins uh, in Yiddish, religion, and history, as you can see from the slide here. My predecessor in the Sheridan Library, Sue Waterman, began to build up the Jewish Studies collection around the materials that had previously been acquired for use in the departments of history, Near Eastern studies, and others with strong interest in Jewish studies shortly after the foundation of the Jewish Studies program in 2002. One of the most efficient ways to make up for lost time was the acquisition of the libraries of institutions and esteemed scholars, including those of Dr. Mordechai Schechter, Rabbi Dr. Arthur Herzberg, and the David S. Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies. Dr. Mordecai Schechter held a number of distinguished positions in Yiddish, including senior lecturer in Yiddish studies at Columbia University. He and his family gave over 9,000 uh, Yiddish books and periodicals to Hopkins in 2007 on a host of subject ranging from aerodynamics to zoology, A to Z. Our Yiddish collection at Hopkins is now world-class, which is one of the reasons we've been very keen to support it through some of the acquisitions we'll talk about a bit later. Rabbi Dr. Arthur Hertzberg, a Hopkins alum, civil rights advocate, and president of the American Jewish Congress from 1972 to 78, and vice president of the World Jewish Congress from 1975 to 1991, donated over 7,000 books on Jewish life and Judaism around the same time. We also hold some books that belong to the David S. Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies in Washington, DC, also donated around the same time. Now, Despite the excellent progress that has been made in the last two decades through acquiring these and other collections in Jewish studies, there are still a lot of gaps that we need to fill in, especially when we consider the breadth and depth of the collections belonging to most of our peer peers in the Ivy Plus Libraries Confederation, uh, most notably the University of Pennsylvania, Harvard University, and Stanford University. I've been supported in this endeavor through seven endowed funds specifically for the acquisition of books, including rare materials for the Jewish Studies program at Hopkins. Acquiring books and other rare materials has acquired more than just money, though. It has also required continued professional development because I wasn't originally hired to be the Jewish Studies librarian when I came to Hopkins in January of 2020. Uh, I was actually hired to be the librarian for modern languages and literatures and comparative thought and literature, which I still liaise with, and I've since added classics to the field of my PhD. The result is that I've had a lot to learn despite having come from a Jewish family and having a doctorate in a related discipline. Collaborating with faculty like Sam and others has been really helpful to this end, and ultimately, as we will argue, mutually uh, beneficial. The following presentation will focus on just a few of the exceptional works we have acquired for the libraries for Jewish studies at Hopkins since the start of the pandemic. And with that, uh, we will look at our first case study, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Sam, who's going to tell us about these remarkable photo books we acquired. Thank you, Mac. Uh, before I, I tell you about this, this amazing book um, that's on the screen right now, I, I just want to follow up on a, a few points that Mac made. And first of all, I want to thank Mac for being such an amazing collaborator um, and helping me identify, find, and explore uh, just a huge number of, of amazing books, books that are often very hard to find uh, and very hard to acquire. Um, Mac, with the support of, of these endowed funds that the library has, is able to, has been able to, to you know, get the library uh, to get a bunch of these. And this is what we're gonna talk about. Um, it's also, I'd, I'd also like to kind of draw special attention to one of the names that 
Mac mentioned, and that's Dr. Martha Schechter, um, whose personal collection of, of some seven or is it 9,000 volumes, um, 9,000, I think, uh, forms the, the core and the majority of, of our Yiddish collection. Dr. Schechter was an extraordinary polymath um, and scholar specializing in Yiddish linguistics. He was also a teacher uh, and he taught a whole generation of Yiddishists, scholars and hobbyists alike, um, including uh, an erstwhile colleague here at Hopkins, Kenneth Moss, now at the University of Chicago, who I believe was instrumental in arranging for Dr. Schechter and his family to donate his books uh, to Hopkins. But this collection is truly extraordinary. I mean, 9,000 volumes um, is a lot. Maybe in the grand scheme of things, might not seem like a lot if you compare it to the number of volumes held by the Hopkins Library, which is, you know, in comparison to even larger libraries itself, Library of Congress or Harvard or whatever, not so big. But in Yiddish, it's extraordinarily large. That's because uh, the number of Yiddish volumes in total is less than, obviously, than, than languages like English or, or German. Um, and it also has to do with uh, the destruction of so many Yiddish book collections in the Holocaust. And um, first of all, the, the absence of, of you know, repositories that could be drawn on, the destruction of private collections, and the difficulty of finding and collecting materials. After the Holocaust, Dr. Schechter um, was a collector and um, as, as Max said, amassed a collection that includes, of course, and this is my major interest, literary works, common and rare, unusual, and what you'd expect, but also things across the range of Yiddish scientific and cultural production. So it's an extraordinary collection. And finding ways to fill it in is an amazing challenge because there's so much in it. So you've really got to get into the nitty gritty to think, oh, what did Dr. Schefter not have that, that we do need? Um, and there's, of course, always room to grow, but with a core like Dr. Schechter's collection, you know, I, I feel extraordinarily privileged and lucky. Uh, there, there are uh, the occasions where I am not able to find something of importance or use or something that I specifically need are, are really quite rare, but they do happen. And when they do happen, that's where Max steps in. Um, and so what we're looking at here is one of the first things that I was actually in touch with Mac about um, when he arrived at Hopkins. And in fact, the, the next book I'm gonna show you is what I first contacted Mac about, but this is a book by the exact same photographer. It's a very cool book by a photographer called Moshe Vorobechik, who is also more commonly known by the, the sort of pen name or, or pseudonym uh, given here on the slide, Moi Ver, um, because in 1931, when this book came out, he was a young photographer who had come from Lithuania, from Vilnius or Vilna, as it's known in Yiddish, uh, where he was born into a traditional Jewish household. And, uh, and he had moved to Germany and studied in the 1920s in the world famous Bauhaus Academy in Dessau, which was the hotbed and central location for the, the cutting edge of architecture, photography, and the visual arts. He had thought he would be a painter, but at, at the Bauhaus, he studied under the, uh, the seminal photographer, uh, Laszlo moholy Naj, and he converted to photography. Uh, and then he moved on to Paris because, you know, in the, in the 20s and 30s, Paris was one of the places to be. When he got to Paris and he was looking to publish his, uh, his first books, he was told that Moshe Vorobechik was perhaps a little bit too uh, Jewish uh, and Ashkenazic a name that he should try something a little more artistic and French sounding. So he switched it to Moi Val. And he published his first book in 1931, a book called Paris. The book Paris is relatively well known, especially by collectors of photography um, and encapsulates really all that's cutting edge about photography and about the city of Paris in the early 1930s. You've got the Eiffel Tower, but you've also got traditional things like hand carts and horses and they collide and they're interspersed and there's collages and layerings and so on. Relatively unknown work by Vorobechik that in my opinion is just as, or maybe even more interesting than the Paris book is this book that we're looking at here. Also published in 1931, not published in Paris, but published in Zurich by a press, the Orel Fusli Verlag, which is still in existence uh, based out of Zurich. 
And pub this, this book was published in Leipzig, which in the period was a center for, um, for publishing Hebrew and Yiddish books. Yiddish books use Hebrew typeface, as you can see here. Um, and so this book, which included Yiddish and Hebrew, was published, printed in Leipzig, but published by a Swiss press. This is a very cool book. What you're looking at is a Yiddish cover. It says Yiddish Gas in Vilna, the Jewish street in Vilna. 65 pictures from Moshe Vorovechik with a foreword by Zalman Schnee, a famous Yiddish writer. But this book was not just in Yiddish. It was published by a non-Jewish Swiss press in three bilingual editions. Show them the covers, Mac. There we go. This book was published extremely unusually at the same time in 1931 in three bilingual editions. German and Hebrew, Yiddish and Hebrew. No, am I, am I getting that right? Help me out, Mac. It was <laughs> English and Hebrew, German and Hebrew, Yiddish and German, I believe. That's right, yeah. Um, it's hard to keep them all straight, but it's extraordinary. This was a press that, that was a general press this book appeared in a series of little photo books that were uh, meant for a, a mass market, published in several thousand um, 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 copies per edition. This was the only book in that entire series which had books on kind of you know National Geographic type ethnographic themes, books about cute animals, landscapes, and so on. This was the only Jewish one. This was the only one that came in bilingual editions. And it was clearly uh, meant to be appreciated by and to, to sell copies to uh, a global Jewish diaspora. It's got English, it's got German, um, which of course there was a large population of Jews in Germany and many Jews throughout the former Austro-Hungarian empire also spoke German. And then it had Yiddish, which was the language of uh, Eastern European Jewry, many millions of Jews who were at the time still living in Central and Eastern Europe and had been migrating for some decades to the United States. So this was a book that out of this Swiss press was aimed globally. Um, and it's interesting. It's a fascinating book, not just because of the strange circumstances of its publication, but also because of what Vorobechik did in the book. Um, could you give us the next slide? Actually, could you, sorry, Matt, could you go back to the first slide? If you look here at the cover, you can see that it's a kind of a cut and paste collage of doors. It's a complicated view, and it makes you wonder, is this book actually supposed to be as accessible as many of the others in the series? Remember, I mentioned that there were books uh, featuring cute pets or books showing off modern architecture. And here all of a sudden we have a complicated, obscure scene of a doorway. And Matt, could you give us the next slide with all four? But if you compare, the, the book, the bilingual edition had front and back. So the Jewish languages and the non-Jewish languages that is English and German are facing into each other, starting at one end versus the other end. So the introduction, the preface, all of that are duplicated. And then the captions are given in both languages on every page. The covers were the only thing that was different. If you look at the Yiddish and Hebrew covers on the top, as I said, the Yiddish says Yiddish Egas in Vilna, the Jewish street in Vilna. Hebrew, Rechov HaYehudim Bevilna, the Jewish street in Vilna. English, the ghetto lane in Vilna, switching it a little bit, introducing this term ghetto, which is taken from the German, which has ein ghetto im Osten Vilna, a ghetto in the east, Vilna. So ghetto in German was often used uh, in the way that shtetl in Yiddish and then later adopted into English would be to refer to a traditional, small, enclosed, heavily Jewish neighborhood and ghetto. But the German points even further im Osten, in the, in the East, this idea of Jewish authenticity being compressed in a city, being to the East of civilization in Germany. And here we have two different views of what it should look like. To the non-Jewish or general audience in English and German, we have uh, just a kind of overhead view on the main street in the Jewish section of Vilna, a rather traditional shot. For the Jewish audience in Hebrew and in Yiddish, we have a kind of edgy, complicated shot raising questions. Are these doors, are they windows? What's on the other side? Who has access? Who is this for? So we have a book that at the same time is trying to speak to two very different audiences in two very different ways. 
All right, Mac, take us, take us forward to the first uh, image inside. This one is called in Hebrew Zoha, which is the, the word for the famous medieval uh, core text of the Kabbalah, the Zohar. It also means literally brightness. The German says im Beit HaMidrash, in the Beit HaMidrash, in the study hall, lair house, study house, study hall. And it's a beautiful, a beautiful shot that uh, in a way that I think is quite characteristic for Vorobechik, both appears to be normal uh, and also is, is quite edgy, um, even in a slightly aggressive way. The glaring light reflecting off of the surfaces of the benches and of the lecterns um, is first of all, a lovely pun on that, on that title, Zoha, right, which is a book. But instead of books on the lecterns, we have the brightness, which is what Zoha means, the reflecting light. So the metaphorically, the light should come from the books. It's a metaphoric light. What, um, what Vorobechik has done here is shown us the light actually just reflecting off of these surfaces. Uh, and it's quite a striking image. Uh, and it's also difficult to achieve, to balance that extreme focalized brightness, that reflection, with the shadows um, and, then, and then somewhat even tones elsewhere in the picture. Um, and at the same time as doing that kind of visual play, the pun, the technical aspects, it's also showing us a view that might otherwise in a more traditional format have been kind of stereotyped or hackneyed. Oh, a study hall, right? Of course, the Jews in the study hall. But here we don't have a view of Jews studying. It's an empty study hall. And what Vorobechik is foregrounding is that visual and verbal play. All right. Um, next shot, please, Mac. Here's another one on much the same theme. Um, as I said, this book has 65 pictures and um, I have uh, worked and written on this book, a chapter of the book that I published last year called Jewish Primitivism. A chapter of my book is about Vorobechik's Vilna photo book. So I could go on about this for, for several hours, um, but I've been told that I'm not allowed to, that I had to choose just a few pictures and I'm pretty sure I'm already on the verge of going on too long about this. Um, so I'll just kind of accelerate through by saying that, that you know, th there are a lot of different aspects to this book. I've chosen this because I think it resonates in a way that, that is somewhat clearer. Uh, and the, the theme is somewhat the same, Jewish learning, Jewish books, but it's, a little topsy-turvy, right? The perspective is literally different than the perspective you'd expect. On the one hand, it gives us a view that is kind of overwhelming and precipitous and scary. You know, the feeling you get when you walk into a major university library, oh my God, there's too many books, how am I gonna read them all? Um, of course, you're not expected to read all of them. And Vorobechik is, is here tilting the books in a way that starts bringing them out of the realm of books to read into the realm of a visual experience, right? It's learning as not only about reading books, but learning as the creation of something different as a prompt for visual creativity. Um, it's also, again, has that kind of playful joking tone that's so characteristic of Vorobechik, um, which is simply, you know, that, that kind of fright that, oh my God, the books are about to fall over. Um, and it's a challenging shot to take. Always with Vorobechik, there's the challenge, there's the technical challenge. This particular library that he's showing us um, was one of the world's, one of history's greatest collections of Jewish books, the Strashun Library of Vilna, um, which was uh, destroyed and, and dissipated during the Holocaust, portions of which were saved. That's a whole long story. Um, for another time, uh, but this was one of the extraordinary book collections um, in Jewish history. Next picture, please, Mac. This is my favorite um, of the whole book. It's a facing spread here. You can see on the left-hand side what looks like an exclamation point. The top part has an archway from over the street. The bottom part, the, the circle, shows a picture uh, of, a, of a man from above which is the same picture that we get on the right-hand side. Um, and there's a long set of puns and associations um, and, and relations here, but just to very quickly encapsulate it and condense it, as I've argued, my interpretation is that this is a joke on the, um, on the Yiddish phrase, das pintele yid, the point 
of the Jew. And it's a phrase that means something like the essence of Jewishness. When, when a Jew is truly Jewish, no matter what, that truly Jewish thing inside that every Jew has, the pintala, the point of a Jew. That itself is a pun on Jewish scribal practices. When you write Hebrew characters in a Torah scroll, when a scribe does, that is, because uh, I don't do it, I don't know if Mac does, um, there are little points that go on top of the letters in some of the scribal traditions. And those points can be called dos pintale, the point of a yid, which in some pronunciations of Yiddish um, is how you pronounce yud, the Hebrew letter yud, right? And of course, yid is the Yiddish word for Jew. So there's an oral pun. The words sound the same, the letter yud and the Jew yid. Dos pintale, and here it is, the exclamation point. The exclamation point is now the dos pintale, yid, the essence of a Jew, right? So there's a cute little pun here. Um, turning a kind of stereotyped image of this stooped, impoverished, suffering Eastern European Jew, right, standing in a, in a muddy, dirty puddle, um, looking kind of like up at the photographer, like what's going on, what's going to happen now. Facing page, this is turned into an elaborate joke, a joke about typography, a joke about uh, a Yiddish idiom for Jewish identity. Um, and a sort of exploration of the relationship between architecture, between human humanness, human identity, and the visual expression of photography. The, um, the caption on the exclamation point side says, Architektur und Mensch, Adrichalut für Adam, architecture and man, right? So what are we exploring here? Vorbechik is always playfully asking. What are we looking at? What do you think you're getting out of this? All right, so those are just a few snapshots from this amazing bilingual book that was published in three editions um, in 1931. I was writing on this book and Johns Hopkins has an amazing collection and had one edition of this book. And I said to Mac, you know, the editions are the same in terms of their visual layout. But the captions and the title pages and nuances in the translations are different in significant ways that are impactful to, uh, to my research. And to boot, I'm not sure that there are any collections in the world that have all three. What do you think? And with the support of, um, of our endowed funds and with Mac's amazing ability to conjure up vanishingly rare books as if out of thin air, Johns Hopkins now possesses all three editions of A Ghetto in the East Vilna, published in 1931. I'm not sure if there are other collections in, in the world that have all three, um, but it's certainly a, a unique opportunity for, for myself or for any researchers interested to be able to see these three rare books all together. Um, all right, next, next one, Mac. Pauline, this is also by Vorobejic, and this was actually the first thing that I contacted Mac about. I didn't end up writing about this in my book, but I was really interested in it, and I had never gotten a chance to see it um, physically because it's even rarer than the 1931 book. The 1931 book, like I said, was published by a, a popular trade press, and there are editions of it out there. Um, it's possible, many libraries have one, Almost none, maybe none except for us have all three, but this Pauline pamphlet was published in 1946, so after the Holocaust. Um, and it's quite a different thing and shows a very different side of Jewish history, of the history of photography and of Vorobechik's career. Vorobechik was a Zionist and in, I think 1933 or 1934, left Europe and went to Palestine, um, which in 1948, of course, became the state of Israel. In 1946, Vorobechik published this uh, pamphlet, little booklet containing loose leaf, 10 loose leaf photographs in Tel Aviv. Next, next slide, please, Mac. And here we'll just look quickly at two of them. Um, here we can see a picture, a very kind of soulful picture that in some ways might, might be more familiar or, or raise kind of a recognition of the famous photographs of Roman Vishniak, for example an Eastern European Jew looking like that stereotypical, soulful, suffering, yet still somehow deep, um, deeply spiritual um, um, aspect. Uh, 
next next picture. Here's a sort of similar theme. Here's a Jew striding through the street, a young Hasidic Jew in a Hasidic cap and a, in a long coat, uh, and an old woman with a headscarf in the background, right? It's more of an interesting shot um, in terms of its action, not a portrait like the last one was, but also showing a very sort of, um, in many ways, traditional view of Eastern European Jewish life. And this is really interesting to compare to what Vorbechik had done 15 years earlier in Europe before the Holocaust, where he was very aggressively and interestingly complicating um, those stereotypical views of Eastern European Jewish life. One year after the war had ended in Tel Aviv, he took negatives and prints that he had taken, photographs that he had taken before the war, since obviously these shots of Eastern European Jews in Poland and that's what the, the pamphlet is titled, Pauline, the Hebrew for Poland. Um, he took these shots before the war. He took them before he emigrated. What he did with them after the war is presented them in a way that now is meant to encapsulate and preserve and transmit that nostalgic view rather than aesthetically going for you know, the avant-garde um, reworking. And this is something that this particular artist did uh, with the same source materials, a reflection, of course, of a changed history and of a, a turn in his career. Um, and this book is, is extremely rare. Um, and I had really wanted to, to see it. And I contacted Mac and Mac uh, waved his magic wand. And within minutes, um, or maybe I'm exaggerating, but, but shortly thereafter, Mac was able to find uh, a copy of this an immaculate condition um, and have it on its way to Johns Hopkins. And if I recall, it was only lost for a month or two in the mail. That's right. It was lost in transit during the pandemic. And I, the seller I worked with thought it had been lost in an airport in, in Europe. And he went to JFK and lo and behold, it was there after weeks and weeks of waiting. So we got very, very lucky. Yeah. Thank God. Because this is, like I said, you know, uh, extraordinarily uh, rare, hard to find. And it's a very, very special thing. Uh, the, the 10 photographs in it are really extraordinary. And the circumstances of its publication and the story behind it tell us a lot about the career of this fascinating artist and about the, the history of Jewish photography over the course of the 20th century. And it's safe at Johns Hopkins now. Uh, and it's a beautiful document. Um, and I'm just so happy that, that Mac was able to find it and that we have it here. I'm able to look at it and work on it and hopefully other scholars will come and look at it too. Okay, so I've now told you about two photograph books. Um, Mac is gonna tell you about something else just as cool, but without pictures. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, another notable new acquisition is this unassuming but very important tract, A Century of Jewish Thought by Henrietta Zold. Henrietta Zold was born on December 21st, 1860 in Baltimore. She was the eldest daughter of Rabbi Dr. Benjamin Zold at the Ohib Shalom Congregation, which was then on Hanover Street and is now um, in Northwest Baltimore, right on the edge of Pikesville. Zold was a teacher and a writer who was probably best known for founding Hadassah, the Women's Zionist Organization of America in 1912. Before she founded Hadassah, Zold was asked to become the National Secretary for the National Council of Jewish Women, which had been founded under Hannah Solomon. Zold declined uh, Solomon's offer, but Zold did address a talk entitled A Century of Jewish Thought to Baltimore's chapter of the organization on January 26, 1896. Her remarks were later published by the Zion Association of Baltimore, the title page of which can be seen here. What makes this document so remarkable is not only that it's just one of seven known copies worldwide and now the only one in the state of Maryland, I might add. It also explicitly discusses Zionism by name more than a year before Theodore Herzl, the spiritual founder of the state of Israel, would go on to convene the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland in August of 1897. Zold was proud of this fact later in life, and it's not hard to see why uh, in reading the tract, since it anticipates so many of the debates surrounding Zionism, perhaps most notably the role of Hebrew, which is seen as the sine qua non of the future of the Jewish people. In this tract, Zold remarks, like our forebears, we are occupied with the criticism in the constructive sense of the word of that vast literature of which has been our abundant compensation for loss of royal power, 
of national independence and of the land promised to our fathers, a criticism, therefore, of Jewish life itself. And she goes on to say, instead of isolating us, Hebrew makes us cosmopolitan in the noblest sense of the word, that is sympathetic with all that is human. I have to say it was inspirational to be able to read this entire document in special collections here at Hopkins. It's an, un, it's an exceptional work of uncanny foresight, and I'm proud of the fact that we were able to bring home a copy to Baltimore to reside in perpetuity here uh, at Hopkins. Now to speak to another remarkable acquisition, Sam's going to tell us about uh, this also unassuming but very, very important book. Thanks, Mac. Uh, I should say that um, the, the polling, before I talk about what's on the screen, the polling um, pamphlet of uh, photographs by Vorobechek, I believe aside from Hopkins is held by only three university <clears throat> or national libraries worldwide, Stanford, um, Hebrew Union College and the National Library of Israel. Uh, there's a chance that it may be held by a couple of um, museums, uh, but they're not listed on any uh, publicly accessible catalog. Um, so we have some, some wonderfully um, um, rare and, and hard to see books. This is another one of them. This is a book uh, that in many ways is very well known and in many ways is hardly known at all. Elie Wiesel's Night, of course, is very well known. A book uh, written in French, uh, published first in 1958 in France, translated in 1960 in, uh, into a slightly shortened edition. Uh, an edition of 116 pages is how we know it in English. Very slim, extraordinarily powerful book, a memoir of Wiesel's experiences in Auschwitz. Wiesel was born in 1928 and as a teenager um, spent the last months of the war in Auschwitz where he was deported together with the majority of Hungary's Jews from outside of Budapest. He survived. Um, and the process, his experiences of surviving, what he saw, the horrific murders, um, the terrible loss of, of everybody, including his father, um, are what the substance of the book is about. Um, but it's also a book about, uh, in a very uh, minor, but significant, because at the very end, it's a, a book about his recovery. Um, the very end of the book is devoted to a description of what happened after liberation when he began writing. And he also describes um, looking in a mirror and, and seeing himself, right? A moment of recognition of reconstituting himself as a human being. That's night, that's the book that so many people read um, that is assigned widely in schools as an essential part of Holocaust education as a powerful literary document and is really the thing that launched Elie Wiesel uh, onto his extraordinary career as a public intellectual, as a sort of moral statesman, and first and foremost, certainly to himself and to his wide audience as a writer of novels, memoirs, and so on. Um, but the French edition, he was living in France after the war. The French edition published in 1958, translated into English in 1960, was not the first edition of this book. The first edition of this book is what we're looking at here, called Und die Welt hat geschwiegen, and the world was silent, published in 1956, all right, 1956, so that is a full um, two years or so before the French edition comes out in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And as you can see uh, on the screen, there's a number 117, it says Bond 117, volume 117. This was published as part of a very large book series in Buenos Aires. The book series um, started by an editor, Mark Turkov, who is a Polish Jew who had emigrated before the war to Buenos Aires, where there was a very large um, Ashkenazic, uh, Jewish, Yiddish speaking population, some 200,000 um, Ashkenazic Jews before the Second World War in Buenos Aires. Turkov began this book series right after the war and uh, eventually stopped it two decades later with 175 volumes. This was number 117. Elie Wiesel was a young journalist who had been sent on assignment from Paris to Buenos Aires. As soon as he got off the boat, the enterprising editor Turkov uh, heard, oh, 
a Yiddish writer is coming to town. He went to meet him. He said, do you have anything for me? As it turned out, Elie Wiesel had spent the entire boat trip, uh, as he later reported in some of his memoirs or, or essays, um, remembering these experiences. He spent the entire lengthy transatlantic boat trip writing a very long Yiddish manuscript, a manuscript that apparently ran to 862 pages. The book that Turkov published, the book that you see the title page of here, and the book that magically Mac was able to acquire for Johns Hopkins, um, has 245 pages. This is a fascinating and interesting book. There is a seminal article, really the first doing a scholarly study of this book by uh, Professor Naomi Seidman, of the, now of the University of Toronto, who studied the differences between the Yiddish and the French and the English and the story of how the one became the other became the third, which is a fascinating story about the creation of Wiesel as a writer, as a survivor, and his presentation to the very different audiences of Yiddish writers, pre-war emigres and survivors, Yiddish readers, that is, of um, French readers, predominantly Catholics, and of English speakers, a sort of global uh, mixed audience. It's a fascinating story, and I cannot recommend Professor Seidman's uh, work high enough. Uh, it's a wonderful um, essay and exploration. Um, but a book like this, a book like this needs to be studied more, needs to be, needs to be understood more. Um, it's hard to find, though. It's a very rare book. This book series published in Buenos Aires. I'm not exactly sure how many copies of each book were published, but from a few hundred to a few thousand, depending. It seems that because of Wiesel's stature, this one is impossibly hard to find. Or maybe they all disappeared into somebody's basement at some point um, in, in the middle of the century. But there are very few libraries, six to ten, uh, worldwide that have this listed as part of their collections. Um, and it certainly is not something that is really ever seen um, in, in booksellers' hands or at auction. It's just, if you want to get a copy, it's impossible because either nobody has them and certainly nobody's selling them. Mac found one and we have it now. Um, I can study it and read it, which I um, am doing as part of a new book project where I'm looking at the entirety of the series in Buenos Aires so many volumes of which the Hopkins Library possesses, uh, including now this extraordinarily rare book, a version of a book that's so well known, but this book really not well known at all. Uh, an interesting question, uh, which um, you know one could ask is, what about translating this into English? Um, of course, with any translating project, there are a lot of issues, but I think one that, um, that is particularly tricky to negotiate here is, of course, the literary estate of Wiesel, um, which um, even if such a thing were, were proposed, that, you know, that would need to be a part of the, of the discussions. Um, because like I said, the, the English version has this lengthy history, has this stature, and here's a very different version of the book. Um, okay, there's more to say, but I'll, I'll stop there on Wiesel. Right, and at this point, I know we're, we're getting actually very close to time. Um, so Sam, I don't know if you'd like to tell us a bit about this format here, just very briefly, and I will offer some remarks about the bibliography and then we can uh, conclude. Yeah, so what we're looking at here are a sampling of Yizker books. Yizker books um, are, are books, um, memorial books to communities, Jewish communities that were of Central and Eastern Europe mostly, uh, that were destroyed in the Holocaust. And these books uh, are fascinating because primarily they were put together by lay writers, amateurs, people who had survived or emigrated and wanted to remember. So sometimes professional historians would write an article or an essay, but very often these things were put together by people uh, on their own, of their own volition, raising funds, doing the whole thing themselves to commemorate either a little village or a larger town, a city or a region. So here we're looking at Brisk de Lita, Brest, Belarus, you know, a, a town of some stature, Cluj, Romania, same there, Kalush in Poland, uh, and, and so on. So every place that had enough people willing to participate and take it on would produce this. 
This taps into longstanding Jewish literary traditions uh, of commemoration and of memorialization. But in the um, aftermath of the unprecedented trauma and destruction of the Holocaust, the literary genre and form kind of became its own thing. And so a Holocaust Yisker book is a very special kind of document. Um, because they were published on an ad hoc basis by groups of people raising funds and writing them and composing them, and putting to get them together as they could around the world, Israel, Europe, North America, South America, anywhere they were, um, it's quite difficult to uh, well, Mac will, will, will address the details of this, but the point that I want to make is that um, through amazing heroic collaborative efforts, survivors and pre-Holocaust emigres were able to produce a very large number of books that are among the most valuable and most important documents that we have about pre-war European Jewish history, culture, life, literature, religion, everything. These Yisker books have it all. Mac? Yes, so I'm just going to speak really quickly to the bibliography of these core books. Um, as Sam said, uh, they are remarkably comprehensive in their scope. Uh, this is an example of a these core book that we have from the Schechter collection, actually, um, from a, a Polish site of um, Gonyonst. And if we look ahead, we can see it's like so many score books, it's chock full of drawings. This is of the shul, maps, and even songs. These are, these are remarkable textual witnesses um, that one is hard pressed to find in any other format, um, which is why we're very keen to continue to collect them. Even though a lot of libraries have started to digitize these, most no notably the New York Public Library, there is an artifactual value to having these uh, be able to hold and have them uh, have that connection. Uh, I estimate we have somewhere in the order of just under 200 these core books here at Hopkins. Part of what's made it difficult to know uh, is that there is no agreement on the bibliographic format um, and what actually counts as a used core book. Um, they range anywhere in estimate from 400 to 1,000. Um, it all depends on who you ask. Uh, but we uh, sellers are well aware of our interest in these core books, and they are continuing to offer these to us on a regular basis. And we have come to build uh, an impressive collection, which only uh, will get stronger. So I know we're, we're just about at time. Uh, so I want to just wrap up very quickly before we go into our Q&A. Uh, in conclusion, I want to stress that the works we've now discussed represent only a small number of those that have been acquired for Jewish studies at Johns Hopkins since the start of the pandemic. Across general and special collections, we have acquired more than 550 works for Jewish studies this past fiscal year alone, many of them rare, all of them significant in their own ways for teaching and research. Though our collection is excellent, we still have work to do to make it even better. Because many peer collections at BG, Penn, Stanford, Harvard, and other institutions have been developed over much longer periods of times by much wealthier institutions, our aim is to expand our volume, but also to continue to identify specific areas for specialization and growth. We look forward to continuing our collaboration together. We hope you'll now join us in the Q&A. Thank you for watching Hopkins at Home. Yes, so I see our first question. Um, is the library seeking acquisitions? How would I know if a book I have would be of interest to the library? Um, the answer is yes, the library is always seeking acquisitions. Um, if you are not sure if it would be of interest, please contact me or one of my colleagues. I mean, I, I, I spend a, a large part of my day working with acquisitions for general and special collections. Uh, so please do be in touch. I, I believe my email address is indicated uh, in the uh, invitation that was sent. So please be in touch. Sometimes people uh, email me uh, asking if, if a book is of interest, but then I have to email Mac. So just go straight to Mac. Uh, he always knows, uh, and he's the person who, who arranges it and ascertains it all. Our next question, do scholars of Yiddish literature from outside GHU research the Sheridan Library's collection? That's a good question. And I don't know if I've been here long enough to say, uh, because of the pandemic, it's been difficult to get a, a sense of who exactly is in the reading room and when. So Sam, I don't know if you can speak to that. You have you have more time here than I do. 
Yeah, but I, I haven't, I've been here a little longer than you, Mac, but not that much longer. Uh, and, and a bunch of years have obviously been pandemic. My sense is largely no. And I think that that's unfortunate. Uh, and I think that there are some things that we can do um, as part of long-term projects to really um, draw in scholars to these extraordinary collections. Um, two particular aspects, the Schechter collection for Yiddish is something that people should, um, should come for. Um, I think that, um, you know, one of the challenges, of course, is producing enough sort of fine-grained detail about what is in the collection to entice people or to let them know what's out there, aside from people who kind of in their own research are looking for volume X and then find that it's, you know, held in this collection, that collection, and Hopkins, um, but to create the thing as, as a draw in and of itself. Something more specific that I am at the very beginning of formulating plans to think about how to draw in outside researchers to come here, to really actively come here and do research is on the Yisker books. Um, because I think Yisker books are, uh, despite the, the number of people who have done amazing scholarly work on it, I think the breadth and scope of this resource is so huge that we need more people working with these books. And that's something that I'm thinking about how to do and how to make happen, which I realize, you know, given the scope and the magnitude of the Yisker books in the world and of our growing collection is something that will be years in the making, but it's something that I'm very much thinking about. So unfortunately, I think that aside from scattered scholars uh, who might drop by, um, we're not yet a destination. Is that something in our future? Hopefully. And I think that ties in with the next question. Do you interface with the Yiddish Center in Hammers, Massachusetts? The, the answer officially is no, but we are we are mindful of the fact that we have remarkable collections and they are growing uh, in, in an unusual area relative to a lot of our peers. So I, uh, I, I would be very interested in the collaboration with the Yiddish Center and, and indeed with the New York Public Library. Uh, they've been at the forefront of the digitization of a lot of these materials. And when you look at our Yiddish collection in particular, you will see books that are, are all but unattested in the United States. So it would be to our benefit and indeed to scholars around the world to, to uh, foster that kind of partnership. Um, the next question, where can I go to learn more about the books? Can I visit the library? Um, so yes, you can visit the library. We are now, oh, the uh, Eisenhower Library and Homewood Campus, uh, which is adjacent to the Special Collections Reading Room and the Brody Learning Commons is open to even non-affiliates. So uh, we encourage you to, to come and, and learn more about our collections. That's the most direct way. Uh, we also, I do, there is a library guide on Jewish studies. Uh, we are in the process of updating it right now, but that is probably the best place to learn about some of these collections. I wanna stress again, though, as I did earlier in the talk, that this is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, it, it, you can name virtually any area of Judaica and we have a, a representative work in the collection somewhere. So I think to learn more, I would encourage you to explore our catalog, library.jhu.edu. That's probably the best place to, to, to start exploring. And if you need assistance to that end, if there's something, something you'd like to learn more about or consult in person, drop one of us an email. We're, we're happy to help. And type into the search box, Mordre Schechter, uh, if you can get the spelling right, a little Googling will get you there. Uh, and you'll see, you'll just be able to kind of go wild in the amazing 9,000 item collection. If you go to advanced search on our library feature, you can select Yiddish as a language and you will be given all the holdings. And the majority of those are from the Schechter family and, and they are remarkable, A to Z. The next question, uh, how much do we know about the history of some of these books? Are we able to trace their ownership? That's a great question. This is something I've struggled with myself. Of course, we are very sensitive to the issue of provenance when dealing with, with materials of this type, particularly those uh, produced in and around the Shoah. So th this is one of the reasons that we only work with established uh, scrupulous sellers who know us and are well known, uh, not only in the Jewish community, but in the, the library community uh, as well. Um, we've done some, do we've all, I usually do due diligence in my end, uh, regardless, uh, always try to. Uh, at least wherever possible. Uh, so to give you an example of the um, the weasel uh, story night, I I went through every library in the region from which the book uh, had been purchased to verify that there was uh, no missing holdings because this, this is such so exceptionally rare. 
I checked the ownership markings of the library and verified that this had in fact been deaccessioned uh, when the seller said it had been. Um, we were not content just to take them at their word for a number of reasons for a work of, of that type. But um, you are correct. This is Providence is, is, is extremely important, but we are not always able to trace ownership very precisely, but we are extremely keen to that. As it happens with the Wiesel volume after Mac, uh, you know, did the due diligence and, and, and certified its authenticity and, and that it was legitimate and purchased it. The seller actually emailed me just to tell me his story about how he acquired the book. He has not given me permission to, to tell that story or reveal his name, not that it's a secret or anything, just that I'm kind of off the cuff um, mentioning it. Um, but you know, some of these, some of these, it's not a kind of crazier story, but it's it's something of interest and something special for the seller himself. So many of these volumes, you know, because they're not 500 years old, they're not going to have these crazy stories of traveling through, you know, um, uh, elaborate adventures. Um, and many of the Yiddish books will have been saved just by fluke or circumstance having been mailed out of Europe before the war and just sat on a shelf somewhere until somebody bought it. Um, and then they either donate it or sell it to us. Um, so it's not so dramatic or adventurous. Um, that's not to say that there aren't some that we don't know about who have stories waiting to be told. Uh, the next question, have the contents of these books been digitized? Uh, the answer is most of them have not. And, and this is something that we have discussed uh, internally one of the reasons we have not digitized these is that many, but not all, of course, these of these holdings do exist in some form as a digital surrogate somewhere around the world. For instance, with the U-Score books, many do exist in the New York Public Library. Harvard uh, Judaica Center has digitized many rare Yiddish books. But of course, there's every book is unique. I mean, even a book that has been printed. So this is the argument that we've been thinking about making it in order to, to digitize some of these, the, the, the rarer materials, particularly the Yiddish materials. But as of this moment, uh, no, very few of them had been digitized, but this is something um, I and I know a number of other people in the library have been uh, keen to explore further. Uh, the next qu question is, what precautions were involved with sending a rare book through the mail? Uh, so this is, this is incumbent upon the, the sellers with whom we work. Uh, these, item, they, these items are all insured on their end. And, and they work with their suppliers uh, to make sure that, they, that we get the materials that we've uh, requested. Uh, beyond that, I, I don't know, I, I'm not a seller. I'm just, I'm thankful for the, the diligence of a, a couple of very prolific sellers of Judaica with whom we've worked and um, who are among the, the heroes in this story who have been able to help source these materials for us. Next question, I think this is for you, Sam. Uh, since I am the art history librarian, I'm fascinated uh, by Vorobitschik's work. He clearly studied with Molly Naj. Do you know how or if Vorobitschik's work is being addressed in art historical research? Yeah, very minimally, very minimally um, is, is the truth. There's a handful of articles in general, whether by art historians or like myself, as I said, a chapter of my book is about Vorobitschik. I'm not an art historian. I hope that art historians will read my chapter on Vorobitschik, but really uh, not that much. Um, a handful of articles, there's been no book length study of Vorobitschik um, and a few more places where he's mentioned in passing or at, at you know some moderate length, but not even chapter length. So really not a lot, um, which is unfortunate because his Paris book is recognized as being significant his Vilna book is clearly equally significant, but hasn't gotten the attention it deserves. Right, well, we are now almost exactly at one o'clock. Uh, so I think we, we will conclude our Q&A. We invite you all to be in touch with us. If you have any further uh, queries, we'd be delighted to speak with you. Uh, thank you so much for your time and attention today. And thank you for watching Hopkins at Home. Thank you all. Uh, like Max says, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, just Google our names and you'll find our email addresses. Happy to answer questions or talk more about the books. Thank you, Mac. This was a lot of fun. Uh, and thank you for watching and listening to Hopkins at Home. Thank you, Sam.